Yeah, uh, I did my undergraduation from IIT Delhi in chemical engineering and I passed in 77. Since then, most of the time I have been in business and uh, start of course, it's the civil engineering, not my subject, but uh, the manufacturing of GeoGrid is something which I understand. And uh, I mean, with the support of our uh, Mr. Bugley and all, we have raised this company since 2004. It's about 12 years since we started. And it's a joint venture company with the uh, Stata US. Stata has been into uh, international uh, business since last 25 years from US. Phil is based in Ireland and he has extremely good experience in uh, many countries and in many, many different solutions like landfills, like mining, like uh, uh, re retaining walls. And that's what we are here to share experience of Phil with us. You can visit his company uh, at Sil Silvasa or Daman, pure Daman, it's not Silvasa, it's in Daman, Strata. So whenever you are there, you can just meet Mr. Uh, uh, you know, Bagli there and Mr. Dalmia and his son is Gautam. So he is a young entrepreneur. MBA from uh, Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. And uh, I, when we, my role in the company right now is to look at business development. So I look at all the new solutions, what is good for the country, what, what, what is right for the country and what kind of solutions we can bring to, to the country. So, uh, with Phil, I've been working on developing more solutions for landfills, mining, railways. You know, there are, India is behind in, in, in many ways when it comes to construction and, and morally adoption in technology. The, the skill is there, the knowledge is there, but the adoption is not there. So, I'm trying to, I get more involved in promotion of these things. So, uh, you know, getting acceptance from people, getting acceptance from government departments. So, uh, I mean, we'll be sharing some of the solutions that we are working on. Then we have with us Mukesh Sato, who passed out from IIT Bombay in 2003 or 2004. So, can you please say a few words, introduce yourself? Hello, good evening everybody. Um, I am Mukesh Sato. Uh, I have done my MTech from IIT Bombay in 2003. Now, presently, I am heading a team of design at Stata as a design. Uh, AGM design, yeah, looking no, after all the all Indian projects related no. to reinforced soil wall and ground improvement techniques, whatever it's applicable at this point. Thank you. Right, good evening. Uh, firstly, just to uh, give you a little bit of an understanding about me, I am an Irish Scottish half breed. So, my mother is from Ireland, my father is from Scotland. And I was born in the middle. So I can step on both sides of the fence. However, one problem. My English is not English. It's a mix between Scottish and Irish dialect. So do you all understand me? OK. So, <laughs> so, so firstly, I would like to say thank you very much Professor Singh for the opportunity to speak to the class tonight. I hope this is basically uh, maybe just the start of something fresh. Uh, so, see, normally on a Friday night at 20 past seven, in London, in Dublin, in Glasgow, in Madrid, we'd be in the bar. <laughs> so, I'm going to speak for an hour uh, and just basically have an open discussion about geosynthetics. Who's familiar with geosynthetics? Have you heard of geosynthetics? Have you heard of geogrids? Geotextiles? Okay, these, these materials are modern materials made of polymer. And what we're doing is we're using them in our geotechnical solutions uh, to improve poor quality soils. So hopefully over the next hour, you will see some of the solutions that we can actually use. And you go, wow. Now, in India, they've been around since the mid-90s, 94, 95. And they went really well for a while, and then they disappeared. And it's really only in the last 10 to 12 years that the use of geosynthetics with our soils in India have become much more common. 
And a little background about myself. I'm a civil engineer first. I did my first degree in civil engineering in a little city called Dundee in Scotland. And in fact, all my lecturers were Indian. They all came over to Dundee. It's a very famous, very famous for concrete technology. So Dr. Sarkar, Dr. Khalid, uh, yeah, you know? Yeah, so I was taught by Indian lecturers. And to be honest, it was a superb experience. So I love be. it's great to be here because I feel I'm hopefully putting something back. So I'm also a geotech engineer. And I've really spent most of my life, my professional life, actually out with Europe. I've worked in Asia most of my life. So at any stage, just feel free to ask me any questions. Let's keep it all informal. So no question is out of bounds. So Strata as a company, uh, I'm based here in this little space here. And my role really is to work with Strata India and develop opportunities globally. Okay, so it just gives you a bit of a map of we are very much an international company. So some of the, the countries that we are working in uh, at the moment, places like, unfortunately, we were really going well in the Middle East, but because of the oil prices, it seems to have really slowed down. But the main areas that we are working in is reinforced soil, reinforced slopes, landfill and mine tailings, which is, I think a lot of you guys are involved with, but also uh, land remediation. So there's things like we were talking about earlier, permeable reactive barriers, etc. Oil and gas, unfortunately, has fallen off the cliff. So it's not really on our radar at this moment in time. So Strata is a very unusual company. We are a geosynthetic manufacturer, but we're also a designer. We're also a contractor. So within India, we offer the full turnkey solutions. Uh, so at this moment in time, Strata India, they started as reinforced soil. So if you're driving through the highways, you will see all these bridge abutments with the concrete block walls or the concrete panels. This is really how Strata India started. So full manufacturing, supply, and construction of these, these systems. But now, over time, we are now moving much more deeply into the landfill and the mining. So what we'll do, we'll just show you some of the products, and then we'll show you how these materials are being used. OK, it doesn't look too much. This is a, a polyester geogrid, OK? There are many different types, but ours is called a knitted polyester. It is, gives you very, very high strain, and we can manufacture up to, are you familiar with the term kilonewtons? The soil mechanics guys here will know kilonewtons. So we manufacture from 30 kilonewtons up to 500 kilonewtons. So very high loading. So again, it's made from polyester. This is just a quick overview. And you see this is the cross section. And these are materials knitted. These are modern materials knitted. And we are using these to reinforce our soil. You can see there's a knitting process here, the geogrid structure. And you'll see how this works as we go through. And then because it's polyester, we have to coat the polyester to protect it from chemical damage. So there's the, the sort of finished product. And again, we have different types. So obviously, when you have different structures, you have different heights of structures, you have different loadings in your structures. Therefore, when you design your reinforced soil, you need different layers of grids and different tensile strengths of grid. And all our structures are designed for 100 or 120 year design life. I don't know why, to be honest. Of all the years, 120 years, it seems very arbitrary, but all our structures are designed for 120 years. Now, how does GeoGrid work? So there's two methods of interaction. So when we compact our GeoGrids in the soil, you have 
the frictional resistance, so it sticks. It's not a very, not the best of sample. I'll pass it around in a second. So it gives you very good interaction. So if you imagine, there's a thing called interaction coefficient. So soil on soil is one, obvious. But if you put the geogrid in there and then compact your soil on top, well, you get a little bit. It's not as doesn't connect as well. So you have a slightly less coefficient. So that would be maybe a 0 0.8, something like that. So you would have a reduction in your coefficient. But the knitted geogrids do give you very high coefficients. The other one, so you can see how this works. There's your compacted soil. So when you try to pull this out, you get this frictional coefficient. Now the other methods are where the soil interlocks in here and you get a passive resistance against your geogrid. But how does it actually work? So there's, you can see, there's your soil and your geogrid. Now this is actually an x-ray photograph. So you imagine, you can see there, when you put the grid in it, you try to pull, you can see the stress, the, the light green. So what you're doing is that's stressing against your geogrids and that's giving you that really strong bond. But how does it actually work? Let's see a little, little example. Let's take a box. You fill the box with a granular material. You stand in the box. The box confines your granular material. But you take away the box, and it slides away. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinforce that soil. Now here it goes again. Here is your box. You put a layer of stone in the base. You put your geogrid in the base. Finish the stone. And you can see. You see how simple concept. Now, imagine how this works. You know a concrete beam, OK? A concrete beam is fantastic in compression, but very poor in tension. So how do you improve the tension capability of that concrete beam? You put in steel reinforcement. So that gives you the composite beam effect. So that's exactly what we're doing here. We're creating composite structures where the geogrid is the steel reinforcement and the granular soil is your concrete. So if you can imagine that concept, that's what reinforced soil is all about. And we can take some very high loads on these. You just see that's the, the car being carried. I think we, we did the, the whole four legs of the car. The materials that we use have, these are modern materials, polyesters high-density polyethylenes, polypropylenes. These are modern polymers. The technique has been around for many thousands of years. This is actually, there's me. So you can see the size of the structure. This is actually, the, it's called a ziggurat. And this is actually in Iraq. Have any of you heard of, well, it was one of the seven wonders of the world, the Leaning Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel? This is the Tower of Babel. So what happened? This is 3000 BC, 5000 years old. It's still standing. And how, why was it built? The reason it was built was the guys who owned all the land in Iraq in 3000 BC, there was no Ferraris. There was no Porsches. They went, look, I'm going to build a big tower. And on the top of this big tower, I'm going to build a palace. And the higher the tower, the more money they had. So this is actually the Tower of Babel. But you can see the layers of reinforcement in the structure going up. But these layers, they were made of straw and coir. But why are they still there? They should degrade. But what happened was, these materials at the time, they were in anaerobic conditions. So they, they, and it was dry. So they didn't have the chance to degrade. That's why. Now, unfortunately, I was in Iraq uh, two and a half years ago. I was in Mosul. And I was doing a presentation. We designed a landfill site 
for Mosul city. And it was three weeks after ISIS arrived. And this has all been bombed, unfortunately, very sadly. Really sad. And hopefully some of it's still there. The Great Wall of China. Again, you can see these are the layers you can see. So these techniques they were using today have been around for thousands of years. So why do we have reinforced soil slopes? Why do we use them in highways? Why do we use them in landfills? So you'll see this. So here's a natural slope. You have a, a clay material or residual clay. You have a natural slope angle. Okay, so that could be 20 degrees, 25 degrees. But sometimes when you're building a highway or a landfill, you want to reduce the footprint of the structure. Because, for example, here, maybe the Indian Institute of Railway doesn't have enough, they can't buy enough land. So they can only buy this land. So what they do is they can steepen up the sides of the slopes. So using geogrid technology. Or we can go steeper again. This is 45 degrees. Or we can go up to 90 degrees. So you can see the benefits here is that we are reducing the footprint of the structure. We're increasing the construction speed so everybody's happy. So when you look at the cost of the geogrid and the installation, it's, when you look at the overall package, it's actually a very economic solution. So we have two types of structure. A reinforced, so we have different design codes, international design codes. Now the ones we use here are BS 8006. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. But when, you, when we're designing a, a wall or a slope, a slope is anything from 45 degrees up to 70 degrees. And then from 70 to 90, it becomes a reinforced soil wall. The design technique is a little bit different because with a slope, we get more benefit from the soil, so you need less geogrids. With a wall, the geogrid is doing all the work, so you need more layers of geogrid, generally. We used to fight with the concrete guys all the time. We want to build a concrete wall, concrete wall, concrete wall. So in 99, we were at a conference, and this guy from a very big concrete company in London called Geosynthetic, what we're doing is the black art, black magic. Now, in those days, it was a little bit black magic, to be honest, because there was no internationally recognized design codes. But now we have international codes all over the world, so we can design reinforced soil structures just like a steel structure, just like a concrete structure. So we have the methods in place. So it's no longer a black art. We had this discussion today. We're looking at a material, uh, it was in a landslide, with very, very low friction angles of around about 15, 16 degrees, with a very high fine content of about 60, 65. Now, yeah, that will be a difficult material to compact, but if you can compact it at the right moisture content and keep the water out of the structure, you can build it. The geosynthetics mainly comprise of two type of uh, compositions. One is something which is made from yarn. And yarn can be a polyester yarn or a polypropylene yarn or maybe nylon even. So the products like geogrids, geotextiles, even non-woven is made from fiber, polyester fiber or polypropylene fiber. So that's one part of the technology and the composition. Second can be made from plastics. Although polyester also is a plastic, but it's more in the textile category. And the plastics can be polyethylene, high density polyethylene, or maybe polypropylene. Generally, these two products are being used where you can make geomembrane for confinement, barrier. You can make geocells for confinement, lateral confinements. You can make biaxial, rigid biaxial grid for uh, uh, load support solutions. And then you can have the PVDs also for the drainage solutions. So uh, this is a mix of, this is all polymers basically, but a mix of uh, uh, yarn plus uh, polyester. And any product can be made, what we are showing, to give any function like uh, reinforcement or filtration or containment or 
uh, UV protection, yeah. all these properties are in it. These are all engineered products. Now, with engineering, as we know what the design engineers require, we can impart those characteristics into these products. That's the art of the manufacturing. We can test them very well. The best part is like civil engineering, you have the most of the products are uh, uh, natural products. But here, there is a product which can be uh, calibrated very well, which can be manufactured precisely, and which can be uh, tested very accurately to know how the performance will be. You can predict the performance at the time of design itself. That's the, uh, the benefit of these solutions. That today we are doing the roads where uh, you see the bad condition of roads because different kind of soils or the compaction method are being used and where people goof up. But if you use the geosynthetic product, these are all calibrated products. We know once we use it, nothing can go wrong with this. So once we understand and design these products very well, I think the results will be much better. If it's a reinforced soil wall, you would tend to generally have a concrete face or a steel mesh face with stone. But if it's a reinforced soil slope, we tend to go for a green face. So a nice vegetated face. So, and these, these faces now, and the green structures are starting to really drive in India now. So there's been some very large projects in India using this technology. So gives you a bit of an idea of the different face types. So we're using a steel mesh ju just as a former. So you can see with the stone, or we can get a nice green face. So you'll see some of the bigger structures that we have been involved with over the years. OK, there's a 45 degrees. So you have your, your primary geogrids and your secondary grids with erosion matting and seed types to get a nice green face. OK? Now, when we're doing a design, typically, a rule of thumb, if, you're, if your structure is height H, your geogrids, if it's a, a good foundation, would be around about 0 0.7 times the height. So if it's 10 meters high, so for example, if this is 10 meters high, these geogrids would be about 7 meters long. But again, it's just a, a rule of thumb. Again, very simple systems. But these are, we can go much, much higher. Again, this is a, a vertical face system. And again, with either green or we can do it with a stone face also. How high can we go? We can go very high. Now, remember, there's no concrete involved here. This is purely polymer reinforcement with a green face. So this is, in fact, Taiwan is one of the, the most advanced countries. They started doing reinforced soil structures in the mid-80s mid using the, the modern techniques. So I, I was based there for about eight years. So I was involved in a lot of these types of projects. And the thing is, remember, we're talking very high earthquake zones also. So you can see this is the structure here. Uh, we're just using it's a very simple technique. This is a reinforced soil slope with a green face. The angle is 70 degrees. We're using what you want to do is to get a nice green face is you can use the sacks. We fill the sacks full of soil and grass seed. And we normally get the grass seed and the plants to suit the locality. So we normally speak to a local landscape guy who knows how the plants work. Because what we're trying to do is get a really good root zone in the face of our structure. So you can see the technique going up here. So there's the structure here. So what we're doing, the geogrids are running into the structure, and then they wrap around and come back over the face. Again, it's a very simple technique. We're using the excavator to get a nice straight face. We wrap the geogrids, they come back around. Obviously, you can see health and safety is very important there. They have good hard hats in Taiwan. So, and there is the green structure you can see the vegetation starting to grow. That's it after about three months. So this is quite a small structure. It's about 10 meters high. But we can go much higher using the same technique. There we go. This is 40 meters high. 
40 meters high on the side of a mountain with a zone 5 earthquake. So you can see we can design and build very large structures uh, using this technology. And that's the green face. So you can see it blends quite nicely. And what we can, we can use any material, sustainable reuse of soils. In Taiwan, we're using a lot of residual clay soils to build these structures. If we can, manu if we can compact the right moisture content, we keep the water out of the structure, we can build these very high. And then you can see here, there's the, the structure in here. Now, that wouldn't look so nice if it was a concrete structure. So, again, these structures are very great because they can just tie into the landscape. This is for a tailings facility. Again, this is in uh, this is Indonesia. So, this is a, a tailings dam. This is the dam. It's 60 meters high using geogrids and soil. It's quite scary, isn't it? 60 meters high, guys. 60 meters. The highest is 100 meters. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the type of technology that we're doing. You imagine building a rock dam. Your rock dam would have angles of about 35 degrees. So what we're doing is we're reducing the footprint of the structure. Mining companies want to build these structures fast, high, and using this technology, we are providing them with the solutions. Now, we have all the software. I mean, these are serious structures, guys, serious geotechnical structures. In Strata India, we have a big design team. We have all, we can do the drawings. So the design team is very strong, very experienced. So these facilities are here, and we have all the modern uh, software. So it's just like any geotechnical structure. So we designed for the internal stability of the structure. So that allows when we there's two aspects to the design: the internal stability of the structure based on the foundation, based on the surcharge loading on the top. The internal stability allows us to work out the spacing of our geogrids, also the length of our geogrids, and then we do the overall global stability using Bishop's analysis. Okay, so it's just like any other geotechnical structure. You can see here, all the global stability. Here's another slope in China. Again, it's around about 30 meters high. You imagine here, if it was a normal embankment, it would be way down here. Okay, so using this technology allows us to reduce the footprint. Now, one of the things that we also like to use is site one materials or remediated materials, sustainable reuse. In Europe just now, all the governments, so the UK government, the Germans, even the French, they're, they're starting to think out the box a bit more laterally. How can we reduce the use of aggregates? What we really... We don't want to strip the earth of, of fresh aggregates, fresh rock. We don't want to be blasting rock. We want to be using materials that are, are poor quality, maybe contaminated, so it opens up a whole new angle. And each of the governments from these regions are saying, yes, we will allow you to develop these technologies. Forget about the design codes, because there's a massive push. And it's great for us because one of the best solutions for geogrid technology is to use poor quality materials like coal ash, like potentially red mud. But you've got to look at how do you stop leaching and things like that. But we are moving in the right direction. So here, this is a structure in the UK and England. It's a classic structure here. We are using coal ash from a power station. So you can see here, there, the black zone here, so there's your coal ash, and this is your backfill behind the structure. But 
you can see if you can compact the coal ash at the right moisture content and you obviously do the, your, your testing as well. You've got to know how does the geogrid interact with that soil. There's a shear box testing, pull out testing. You all have to do the test. You've got to do the work. If you don't do the work, you can't use the materials. Uh, so this is a structure going up. It's 40 meters high. So you can get a good idea that now, 10 years ago, there was no way we would have been allowed to use coal ash. Just the codes wouldn't allow us. The governments wouldn't allow us. So this is a big technique. And in India just now, we have been talking to the companies. Now, has it been successful? Slowly. It's a slow burner. But once we get it, it will happen. And I think people are saying, yep, we like this idea. But give us the confidence. No, it's going back to the, what's the code? What's, you know, we've got to give the confidence and see these structures going up. OK, yeah, because Mr. Bagley has been involved. So, but it's just getting the confidence with the, with the companies. But we'll get there. OK, is so another structure? Again, these are a lot of dams for mine sites. So this is a, a 40 meter high dam. Again, just using geogrid technologies. There's the dam there. Again, that's another picture of myself there. This was actually quite an interesting project. This is in Taiwan. And I arrive on the project site. And I go up to the construction to meet the client. And I arrive. And there's a huge black limousine with blackened out windows. And there's two guys standing, one at this end, with black suit, white shirt, and little black tie, black sunglasses, with Uzi machine gun. Uh -huh. It was the Taiwanese mafia. And I walked in to the office. And he was sitting like this, with the feet up on the table. Ah, Mr. Phil. Welcome. Thank you for making me a millionaire. What this, this structure was, and this is going back to 1998, this was a landfill site after there was an earthquake in 1998 called the Chi-Chi earthquake. And then the Ministry of Environment in Taiwan virtually overnight turned around and said, you cannot dump the earthquake rubble in the sea anymore, in the ocean. So this Taiwanese guy went, aha. He bought a valley in the mountains. And he approached us and said, look, can you do a dam, a reinforced soil dam? And all the earthquake rubble was dumped behind in here. It was fantastic structure. Fantastic. India, I think, one of the biggest structures is about 75 meters high. So good structure. So now, now we'll sort of move into the, the landfill phase. Uh, one of the benefits of reinforced soil, especially in landfill now, is really for landfill expansion. So you have a landfill that's just a natural, so it's here, and it's reached its capacity. So what we are doing now is creating reinforced soil boundary walls, effectively, around the construction site. So as these raise up, we have huge increased capacity. Now, we're doing a very large one just now in VAPI, VAPI Landfill. I'll show you, and it's a really cool project. So, again, this is the technique that's really moving well. Again, it's just going back to basics again. Geogrids with the steel mesh, and it goes green. You see the structure? That was a, the team on another project I was involved with. But again, you can see a nice green structure and uh, good vegetation. And you can see that's the original landfill. Now we have all this additional capacity in this void space. Again, we're using the, the steel wire mesh. The steel wire mesh is a, it's a sacrificial former. It allows construction experience. It allows you to build the structure quicker. It also gives you a nice straight face. Okay, you can see here there's the geogrids, stratagrid, the steel mesh here, the geogrid. 
wraps around here. We fill this with backfill. So you can see the backfill going in here. So this is the primary geogrids running this way. Okay, then you're compacting your soil. These all, this all has to be compacted to like Proctor 95 compaction. Okay, so when you're using lesser quality materials, you've got to look at that compaction a little bit differently. So, so this is one in Hong Kong. Again, you can see the steel mesh, the geogrid reinforcement. This is a structure that's about 80 meters high. So this is a landfill expansion. So this will add another 25 years of design life to that landfill. So basically this was, you had a, a mountain here and a mountain here with a gap in the middle. So 80 meters high, how do we do it? There's no way you can do it with concrete. So using reinforced soil technology, this is the system that we designed. Now, this is a, a temporary cover over the face. It's just to prevent uh, wind erosion. Okay, because remember, here, this still has to raise, so it's going to be another five years before it hits here. This will be exposed. Now imagine if you were to build that as a normal embankment, it would be way down here. Okay? So don't be scared. Think out the box, guys. You can build them high, but you've got to do the work. You've got to do the testing. This is VAPI. But this is probably one, uh, one of the first of its kind in India. But also, it's actually, it's actually a big one internationally as well for us. So who, who's all been to VAPI? Everybody? So here's a, well, I mean, you've, you've seen the plan. You, you know how the system's working. So, so this is the, the boundary wall around the site. So it's a double-sided double reinforced soil. This is the inside face for the has waste. Now, it is hazardous waste. I mean, probably the worst I've ever seen, to be honest. So uh, I was walking in my shoes. The, the shoes melted. It was that bad. No, it wasn't that bad. But. So it's a structure that's going to be 15 meters high. At this moment in time, I think it's about 8 meters high. So we still have another lift to go. Eight and a half, yeah. So... Normally, we'd probably like to see a green face on the outside, but the client was looking to have a, a low maintenance finish, hence why we used the, the modular concrete block. But again, an interesting design, and again, it gave, or it's going to give a huge increase in void space for that site. Again, very simple technology, wrap around using bags, white bags, it doesn't really matter what it looks like, because it's on the inside face, therefore it's more for functional use as opposed to a nice special green finish. There's the outside face. We obviously have the machines and we were manufacturing the blocks ourselves. And there is the wraparound. This is the, the low. But you've got the geomet the protection geotextiles, then the geomembranes, etc. It doesn't look that pretty, but it's functional and it works and it gives us increase in void space that we need. The strong, let's say, marine clay, uh, the major job becomes then to improve when you, the, In this particular project? Not in this particular project, any other project where you are doing expansion right, well, of the landfill. This, and the ground conditions are not very good. Yeah. Well, okay, depends on what's the construction time for that structure. Uh, now I'll give you an example in Europe. If we are building a structure, uh, just say a highway, for example, highway embankment over marine clays. In the old days, you may have two, three years to build this structure. So what we would do is we would use geogrid in the base. So we design uh, a basal platform using geogrids. Okay. So we'd work out what the undrained shear strength is of that. Now it's obviously going to be very low. Could be 5 kPa, 5 kilonewtons per square meter. So what you would do is you would design a platform, and that platform would give you the factor of safety to build the structure to a certain height. So if the structure is 15 meters high, you may work out that you can only build the structure 3 meters high. 
And what you do is that allows, so the granular geogrid platform below gives you the factor of safety to build it for three meters. And then you monitor the settlement. You, you put an instrumentation into the structure and into the foundation. So you monitor the pore pressures, you monitor the increase in shear strength as the weight of that three meter structure moves down. Once it gets to a certain stage, you can then go up to the next height. So you'll have designed this. Now, that is if you have time for construction. But now what's happening is the many structures, especially in Europe now, the, the program for construction is much faster. So therefore, one of the techniques that we use is we, we still have to build on the soft ground. So what we use, we're using pile, piling system, again with a granular pad with geogrids on top. So what happens is the load is dispersed through the granular platform down into the piles. And the design is 120 years. So you can build the 15 meters, boom, straight off. We don't, this is the major problem. This is a major change in our design technologies. So speed of construction is, is changing the base load requirement. Const it is, it is expensive. Well, you can look at different types of, it's not, it doesn't have to be concrete piles. Like in Malaysia, we have used timber piles with steel caps. So very, now in India, we probably can't do that because trees are special here. PVDs, you can use, yeah, vertical drains, you know, prefabricated vertical drains to get rid of the pore pressures. But even then, it's not as quick as, And it's, it's, it's more difficult also, and you know, one of the big problems we have in Europe, it's not clays, it's more organics like peat soils. So you have two consolidation periods. You have primary consolidation, which is the most rapid, but the problem you have is the secondary, the, having the secondary consolidation, how to monitor that is very difficult. So the governments in the UK will not allow things like that. So you've got to basically either dig and dump Dig it out and replace or use piles. So again, in more the, the different countries, they have different regulations. So piling is very expensive. But sometimes regulation dictates that we have to use piling. So okay, this is another landfill extension. This is Atlanta in Georgia. Again, here, so there's the original uh, landfill. So this is at capacity. So we're building a reinforced soil structure here to give that increase in capacity. So there's the, so that's the waste future. Puts another 15 years of capacity on the project site. So WAPI is the same, same idea. And this model is now proving very popular internationally. It's become a model as opposed to a technique. So you can see that's going up there. You can see it's a big landfill site. Again, using the geogrids and a stone face the stone face, to some people, gives it more longevity. Now, so that's the reinforced soil aspect uh, within landfills and mining. So what we'll do is we'll spend the next 15, 20 minutes time-wise. Is that okay? Um, and we'll just look at some of the, the more, the different techniques for capping here. We were at a conference yesterday. Uh, there's a new laboratory opening up in Ahmedabad. Uh, it's going to be really modern for geosynthetics. 
So it's, it's good news for India. These people have spent a lot of money building this new test house. So they had a nice symposium about landfill and new, new design and capping. So this is just showing you some of the techniques that we can use. And you'll start to see this more prevalent in India now. This is a, a classic picture of uh, a waste, has, not a has waste, a domestic waste. So this is your, your new cell development at the bottom. As we fill with waste, we will uh, cap and gas vent, etc. Is there, is there much methane extraction here for energy? But it should be, surely. Under where my Okay. So, which is good promising results for them to convert to energy. So, they have it in mind and they have taken steps in that. Then, one question I would like to ask is all the landfills which you were mentioning is either about, uh, which was taking rock fill material or inert material basically, like yep. Wapi also, which has inert. So, when you talk about in India, in, in context of India, all the municipal salt base has high amount of organics, so around 45 percentage of organic. You can say, Compared to developed nations, the organic content is very high. So it is like a dynamic muscle keeps on degrading. So how feasible is this in case of such kind of compositions? Well, you've been using it for reinforced soil as such. In case of landfill or like both uh, ca capping and... I was asking... Oh, you mean for settlement purposes, etc. Yeah, so since it is a degradation compared to the like uh, developed nations or... The organic factor is very high in yeah. our waste composition. So how feasible is it like a promise? Okay, well, one of the things, yeah, normally in Europe, the caps would be, we'd have a very good regulation layer and the settlement would be taken out over time. But what we're using is, if we have problems with extensive settlements, we would use, again, geogrids to bridge the gaps. So we would use a, like a polypropylene geogrid, very stiff geogrid, and that would be designed into the final cap, and that would bridge any settlements. Because the problem you have is, if you have major settlement, it means your geomembranes or your geosynthetic clay liner would open, which allows rain or methane gas to escape. So yeah, you can design for that. So. The material which is uh, uh, capable enough of disenabling that, what about the material that you must have designed for the geomembrane? So that water in the is coming down, that it is able to penetrate it and go down further. Well, I mean, for for WAPI, the geomembrane, yeah. So I mean, I, we don't really know exact in materials like polymers, like polyethylene and polypropylene, they're actually chemical quite st pretty stable. So it'd have to be a very low low pH, a very high pH. In fact, poly polyethylene, polypropylene, is more of a problem at low pHs. Uh, so. They are pretty chemically stable, though. But no, that's a good, it's a good point. But one of the things with mining, and we've had a lot of conversations with clients, and it's a very taboo subject, because there is absolutely no way that a geomembrane, and sometimes backed up with a, a geosynthetic clay liner, are you familiar with them? That would be a typical in the base of a, a large tailings facility. There is absolutely no way that that will not leak. It will leak and you will have that material will be in the groundwater. And the argument is they, it's a risk versus commercial cost. And it's never going to change. So the Rio Tintos of this world know that a membrane and a GCL when you've got 100 meters of tailings on top, it's going, it's going to fail. And it doesn't matter what you do. That's, well, it looks as if it's doing, and it's been approved. But the thing is, the environmental bodies are approving these systems. So it's, it's risk versus commerce. And, and that's, with the mining, sadly, that's the case. It's not the case in the landfill site. The regulations are much more stringent 
in the base of a landfill. So, for example, here, in the base of a landfill, you would never see this on a tailings lagoon, ever. You just see GCL, geomembrane, maybe a little bit of a protection geotextile on top, but nothing else. Whereas here, if you've got the base of a landfill, you've got a, a mineral clay barrier, or it could be, if it's not natural clay, it could be a thing called BES, bentonite enriched soil, where you're mixing bentonite with soil to create an impermeable barrier. And then on top of that, you've got your geomembrane. But on top of that, you have your very thick protection. Well, we dis this was a big discussion yesterday. What's, I think what's specified here is in the regs, 250, 250 grams per square meter. And a non-woven geotextile to protect the ge That's not going to happen. Use nothing because it's not doing anything. You've got to design it properly. And our, but again, it's a commercial decision. So sadly. Again, so once you've got your, your leachate in here, so you've got all your waste on your leachate stone. That's putting pressure on your geomembrane. So you have to protect the membrane with a geotextile cushion. How do we design that? That will be for another day's work. I've got a big technical presentation on that. So, And then what do we do with our cap? We've got to vent the methane using geocomposites. And either we use a, a geomembrane to stop the rain coming in and prevent the methane coming out. So this is a, a typical cross-section. This is a classic. So this is the old days. The cover soil would be one meter. A granular drainage layer stone. Layer, so when the rain comes down through here, this takes away the rain, and then you have your mineral seal. This is the old days. This is the modern version. And we get extra void space. So if you have an area of maybe 500,000 square meters, and you're saving, say, an average one meter void space, doesn't sound much. But in reality, it's a huge space. So using these materials, which are quality assured, ease for construction, is, is the way forward. It's a picture of our systems, some geogrids, uh, geotextile protection, geomembranes, etc. This would be a, a typical system. So basically, from the bottom up, you would normally have a, it's come back to your question. We've got to understand how the degradation and how the settlement over time is. Because we have to have that regulating layer to allow your geosynthetics to be placed on top. You have to have your gas, methane, venting layer. Now, I'm not sure if these systems are actually currently used in India, but they will be in time. This is how it's, it will happen in time. They're becoming commercially much more viable, so the clients are, seem to be more happy. Your impermeable seal, we normally go with a one millimeter, low linear density polyethylene. We don't use a GCL, correct, Mr. Bagley? We don't use GCL. Mr. Bagley hates GCLs. Uh, and then we have our drainage layer. And then the secret is a good vegetation layer on top of that cap. You want to get a good root zone because that is acting as a surface barrier. The composite is really there as a backup. Once you have a root zone in that soil, the water will shed off. The roots will take the water, even in monsoon times. You, once you have a good root zone, the water will be controlled. Now, how do we get a good root zone in red mud? That's a different day's work. Okay, So that's something that we can discuss at a later stage. Here's a typical example. This is a, a project in Spain. It's about 500,000 square meters. This is a cap, so you can see there's a geomembrane. This is your drainage composite here. But the problems you have is you can see on the side here, these are very steep side slopes. As soon as you go over the magical one in three, whoosh, your topsoil will just slide right off. So you've got to come up with ideas and techniques. Again, either using geogrids to act as a, a veneer stability, 
or geocells, which are proving very popular here. So this can find the topsoils. So there, there are a few projects here in India. Again, you can see this is some of the systems here. This is the strata drain and your cover soil. Again, it's all about increasing the void space. Now, it might be different here, but in Europe, tons of waste is money to the client. So the more void space they have, the more money they make. Now, it may be different here because I don't think there's great value in selling it. But again, the most important thing is the stability of your cap. You imagine you have a slope. You have a slope that could be 1 in 3, 1 in 4, 1 in 2. Scary. 1 in 1. Oh. But when you've got all these different geosynthetic systems and you're going to put a cover soil on top, you've got to do your veneer stability calculations. So we can do all that type of work because you've got weak zones. So you've got to understand the interface friction. That's why geomembranes that were smooth are now textured. Because when you put a geomembrane, a textured geomembrane, and then you put your composite or your textile, it's going to stick like a Velcro. So that gives you an increased interface friction. So what you're doing is you've got to work out where is your weak zone. It's normally your topsoil or your clay on top of the geocomposite. That's your weak zone always. So sometimes you put your geocell or your geogrid in that space. We don't like mem smooth membranes on steep slopes. Forget it. Don't do it. It's old technology and it's not going to happen anymore. Because sometimes we're dealing with very steep caps. That's around about 45 degrees. So how do you put the cover soil on there? You've got to use a geocell. This is one that was done in New York. Uh, this was, this is an old 100 year old landfill that was opened up after the 9-11 when the Twin Towers came down. This site was opened, 400 acres. It was reopened to take all the waste, all the rubble from 9-11. 400 acres, the whole site increased by 5 meters. That's how much waste was there. And then it all had to be capped again. So this was a really, really good project. And it's, it's still ongoing. Again, you can see a textured membrane with your drainage composite on top. Because when you put your cover soil on, you don't want that sliding. OK, this is a, a line of protection in uh, New Delhi on the landfill site there. So this is your cap. This is your steep slope. As you can see, it's one and two. Steep. So anything would just slide right off. So here we had to use a geocell anchored into a trench at the top. So you can just see I'm running out of time. So this is all designed, part of our process. Have you guys seen the sort of like the Excel spreadsheets that we have? No? So there's your, uh, your prepared ground. You can see very steep, one and two. The geogrid goes down first, and then your geocell is going on top. So the idea is, if you have a very steep slope and a long stretch, a long slope, you would normally put in tendons. Those tendons would take a lot of the force. Okay, but in this case, we used our geogrid, and the geogrid was taking the force. So it's a good technique that's uh, proving very popular. You can see there. The technology is being used here, which is great. And then some runoff trenches. Same idea again. Geogrid on the underside on top of your geomembrane. So it's the geogrid that's taking the main force. OK, there's also tendons in here also. That was a very steep slope. How steep was that? 45? Again, once you get that vegetation in place, it gives you really strong surface armor. Some big mining projects. This is in Peru. So this is actually a, a cap. So another cap in the US that we were involved with. Again, very steep side slopes. Again, this is a, a full construction. Uh, the complete closure, 
of a landfill in Philadelphia. Again, very steep side slopes, so again, lots of geogrid technology. Flood storage. Okay, bottom layers. Again, you've seen this earlier. So we're using mineral barriers, geomembranes. Depends. Leak detection is another big thing now as well. A lot of clients are looking for leak detection systems also. But you see, you have to protect that membrane. So using the design, we, we have a, in Europe we have a thing called a cylinder test, whereby we take the height of the waste, in this case it's around about 40 meters high, we put your leachate stone, so it's in a, a cylinder, and then we load it up and we put the pressure on the membrane, and that allows us to calculate the strength of the non-woven geotextile protective fabric. It was discussed yesterday, but I think a lot of people panicked because sometimes you need a very thick protection if you're going to do a proper design. And I don't think it's commercially viable yet. So I think instead of going from 250, we're going to maybe run up to 600 grams, is it? So the new regulations will be 600. Now that's better than 250. Okay, so we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there in time. Again, this is a, a tailings facility. And this is uh, the Red Mud site in Ireland. So this was a full 1 million square meters, full line system. It's, it's hard to look at the scale because this original tailings, the dam, is 50 meters high. It doesn't look like 50 meters high, but it is. So the, all the, the berms around here are going to be built up to 50 meters high over organic peat soils. So the pressures on the membrane are massive. So you've heard of a consultant called Golder Consultants? Very famous consultant. Well, their number one mining guy was on the project site with me. The first day we were doing the installation. And the peat soil was just like this, up and down. GCL and geomembrane. It's going to fail, I say. I don't care. Just build. The mindset with mining, guys, is just completely different from landfill. The client doesn't care. I don't care. As long as the environment ministry signs off, we don't care. It's a visual thing. It's, it's, it's quite puzzling because the legacy waste from these sites is enormous. The legacy waste. And this is, this area here is a natural site of scientific interest. What can I say? As one in Turkey, uh, again, GCL geomembrane. You can see the G, G, look at the height. This is 80 meters high. Damn. This is all going to be filled with toxic waste from a silver mine. Cyanide, basically. And we are very complacent about the systems that we use. Again, this is a landfill site, so you can see much more different system, regulated. Okay? And that's it. That's me. This is the best project on the planet we've ever done. And this was an open cast coal mine in the north of England in Newcastle. And you can just see at the edge here, this is the open cast site. Just at the edge, I mean, it's a huge hole. And there was, we had to restore the site back to the ground. But there was hundreds and thousands of tons of colliery spoil, waste, ash, and there was contaminants in it, and it had to go to a landfill site, a has waste landfill site. But we don't have hazardous waste landfill sites in Britain. So it had to go to Germany, or it had to go to Sweden. It was going to cost something like $15 million to send this material. So the client just went, ah, no, can't afford it. So we went and had a meeting, and we had a big brainstorm session, just an open forum. And we said, why don't you use the waste and we'll build a community park? We'll turn the site 
into a community park so people can come and have barbecues and have a beer. And, Are you crazy? I went, it's just an idea. So, one year later, we got a call. Can you come to a meeting? And we met this American landscape architect. This guy was mad, a real eccentric. His name is a guy called, called Charles, Charles Jenks. If you Google Charles Jenks, you'll see J-E-N-K-S. Google him. His website is amazing. He's, a, he's like Picasso. He's, like, he's a crazy guy. So he came up with, do you think you could build that? And we went, what, using the waste? He went, yeah, using the waste. So we came up and we said, OK, we'll give it a go. So we came up with some design concepts. So so these were his types of drawings. Remember, this is a material that's got a friction angle of about 20 degrees. It's going to collapse all over the place. So he gave us all these little drawings, and we came up with all these techniques. Sustainable reuse. So we designed geogrids for the chin, the nose, reinforced chest. <laughs> Everything was reinforced. The whole project was reinforced. So there you can see that's the open cast site here. And all the coal you despoil, you can see this is it going in here. This is the footprint going up. Now remember, this is 600 meters long. It's 60 meters high. It's the biggest land sculpture in the world. It's huge. You can see that's the the reinforced, everything is reinforced. You can see there. Even soil nailing of the temples, everything. Soil nailing, erosion, geocells, everything. So going up. Getting greener. And that's the finished structure. And now it's a community park. And everybody goes there with their families at weekends. It's a cool. And what was fantastic about it, there was a one contractual issue. <laughs> everybody came to work in the morning with a smile on their face because it was just a, the most fun project ever to work on. So, so think, let's see if we can turn Bombay. What's the name of the landfill? Let's turn it into a community park. So that's me, guys. All right. Thank you guys for your time.